be that. But let's um, turn to John chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 22 through to chapter 4, verse 3. <clears throat> After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going uh, to him. If you've not tracked with us, he's talking, they're talking about Jesus there. They say, look, remember that guy that you testified about, John, uh, Jesus, Everyone's going to him, okay? Uh, so verse 27, to this John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. But whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son <coughs> will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Please do keep that open if you've got a Bible or a device in, in front of you. That's where we're going to um, be this morning. Um, so, what do you think? That's what my now wife uh, said to my uh, now mother-in-law, prospective mother-in-law as she was. So, what, what do you think? I won't tell you what she said. Um, <laughs> no, it's all, it was all good. It's all positive. So, what do you think? Uh, we've begun to meet Jesus, haven't we? We've begun to meet Jesus in John's Gospel. Perhaps for you, this is your first encounter with Jesus. This is the first time you've, you, you've met him. Um, for some of you, it, you've met Jesus many times. Uh, but we've begun to meet Jesus in John's Gospel. And uh, we're going to have more opportunities through John's Gospel as we go along, for sure. But uh, as you get to the end of chapter 3, it's like chapters 1, 2, and 3 are a kind of block. And there's a pause moment where we get to just go, what do you make of Jesus? There's like a little moment, an interlude, if you like, to just go, you've begun to meet him. What do you make of him? Everyone has to respond to Jesus, don't they? Uh, put, the, put the Bible and Christianity as such a sign, theology and all that stuff. Let's just go secular for a moment. Uh, you, you, you have to respond to Jesus simply because of his impact on the world. Just for starters, and um, this is uh, Yaroslav Pelikan, uh, the late uh, Yale uh, University professor and historian. He said, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of, the Western, uh, of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. You get that? Jesus uh, of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. Then he says, if it were possible with some sort of super magnet, to pull out of that history every scrap of metal bearing at least a trace of his name, how much would be left? And the answer is, not a lot. 
Because uh, Jesus' fingerprints are all over our culture, uh, our world, the way we think in the West, uh, the arts, the uh, science, all kinds of areas of life, architecture, music. Jesus' fingerprints are all over our culture. And so everyone has to respond to Jesus. Just at that level, just as a thinking adult here this morning, you, you've got to wrestle with Jesus. You've got to respond to Jesus because he's the most dominant figure in Western culture for 20 centuries. That's his impact. But there are his claims as well, aren't there? As you delve further into the Bible, you realize that he claims to be the Son of God. That he uh, claims to be God's promised king. That he claims that he can heal. That he can restore people. That he can change and transform people's lives. That he can forgive Now, I can forgive, you can forgive, but he's claiming that he brings God's forgiveness down to earth to you. These are massive, staggering claims, aren't they? Uh, they? The the, the big claim, I guess, is that this man died on a cross and three days later rose again, that he was alive, that a dead man walked. Now, they're claims you can't ignore. You have to respond to this Jesus. Everyone has to. What do you make of him? We're going to think about this this morning under two headings. I guess this is the the, the main and and first. Big up the bridegroom. And the situation here is that they've gone to the countryside, haven't they? Verse 22, Jesus and his disciples went out to the countryside. Uh, uh, It's interesting, isn't it? It says where he spent some time with them. Jesus' relationship with his disciples isn't just purely functional, is it? Like he says, train them up and then they're going to do some stuff. Actually, Jesus just spent time with them. And he spent time with them and they baptized. And, uh, and then we meet John the Baptist. He's back again, isn't he? We saw him in chapter one. Uh, and his disciples uh, are with him. He has some disciples as well. And uh, an argument develops between his disciples and, uh, and someone about this matter of ceremonial washing, verse 25. And then they come back to John the Baptist uh, and they say to him, as, as we noted, they say, uh, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, Jesus, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. What do you think is going on there? What's the dynamic that I think there's a little bit of jealousy there, isn't there? Or just kind of sticking up for their rabbi, John the Baptist. He's their teacher. He's he's the one that they're following. And now everyone seems to be going to Jesus. And they're a bit concerned about this. So they come to John and they they tell him uh, what's going on. Uh, But John replies, doesn't he? It's fascinating. His reply to this is really the heart of this whole passage. His reply, uh, verse 27, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. Uh, And then he says, verse 28, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. Remember that chapter one, John was just constantly saying, I'm not the Messiah, I'm not God's king. I'm not the promised one. Jesus is. I'm just sent ahead of him. John is like an outrider. We saw a lot of those around the Queen's uh, funeral and other events, didn't we? An outrider or a forerunner or a messenger or he's the guy that's rolling the red carpet out ready for King Jesus. John is not the main event. And that's what he's saying here. And then he brings us into the, he uses a picture, doesn't he, to try and explain this. He uses this picture of a wedding, basically. He takes us to a wedding, and and there's a bridegroom, there's a bride, there's the friend of the bridegroom, that's John. Uh, And on he goes. We'll come back to that uh, in just a moment. But there's there's another picture here as well that's being used by the author, John, of this gospel. Uh, And this is the idea that John the Baptist is like a little lamp. He's like a little lamp. Yeah, Jesus is the light of the world, big light, capital L. But John is like a a little lamp that points uh, forward to Jesus. Uh, Actually, all all the time here in these chapters, what's happening is that we're being presented with both signs and lines of testimony about Jesus. So think back to the wedding at Cana. I know we didn't look at it thoroughly, but Jesus said that 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 was a sign. That was one of a a sign. There were a number of them through John's gospel. This is a sign, and then there are lines of testimony. We've met various people and their testimonies about Jesus. We're being introduced to, if you like, these little lights, signs and lines of testimony that all point to Jesus. And John the Baptist is one of those. Jesus says in chapter 5, Uh, Verse 35, John was a lamp that burned and gave light and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. So he's like a lesser uh, light. 
Uh, J.C. Ryle, the vicar at Helmingham, as he was, uh, and later the first bishop of of Liverpool, uh, said this. He said, Christ must and will become greater and greater, and John the Baptist himself must become less and less important, until like a star eclipsed by the rising sun, he has completely disappeared. That's what's going on here. Uh, John is a star, an eclipsed star, eclipsed by the rising sun of Jesus. Do you remember the adverts? Jaffa cake adverts. She used to sit with her. Do you remember the woman who sit with her little boy, packet of Jaffa cakes, and she'd get a Jaffa cake out, and uh, she'd go, full moon? And she's teaching him science, yeah, full moon. And then she'd eat half of it, half moon. And then she'd put the other half in her mouth, total eclipse. So she was French, wasn't she? Or total eclipse, she used to say. <laughs> you can hear it, okay? And then, and then she'd go, one more time, because repetition's good, isn't it, teachers? Yeah, that's how you learn. So one more time, and she'd work her way through the packet of Java, well, full moon, half moon, total eclipse, one more time. Uh, and that's what's happening here. John the Baptist is being eclipsed by Jesus. Uh, that's a, a picture, but back to the wedding, because that's the main picture here, isn't it? It's a wedding. He, he uses that imagery, doesn't he? Here's the bridegroom, here's the bride, here's the friend of the bridegroom, or as we would understand it, the best man. My best man was my brother. Um, he did a cracking job. Uh, the, the, the point in our culture, the point of the best man speech is to entirely obliterate uh, the bridegroom, isn't it? Just destroy him completely get uh, stories and things and comments and pictures or whatever from way back talk to all the family and friends and just pull it all together and then edit that down into a speech which completely annihilates uh, the bridegroom and he did a fantastic job it was hilarious people were crying with laughter people were nearly on the floor um it's a it's a cracker if you if you're just feeling a bit low you know the sort of autumn winter's coming and you want something to just lift your spirits I'd recommend my brother's um, best man speech. Um, it was uh, hilarious. Uh, and then apparently the next morning, we were long gone, but the next morning with whoever was there, he then went through the full version because that wasn't the full version. He was editing as he went. He was throwing bits out and, no, oh, we ain't got time for this. Um, but it was a fantastic speech. But uh, the, the best man and the friend of the bridegroom here, they don't exactly map onto each other, slightly different role, but it's the same kind of idea, isn't it? The best man uh, alongside the bridegroom. And at the end of the day, it's his big day. It's not about the best man, is it? That's kind of the point. The, the best man's there to sort of prop up the, the bridegroom and the bride. It's their big day. It's not about the best man. Uh, and, and he's there in a, in a sense to sort of big them up. And that's what John is doing here. And he wraps up in verse 30, doesn't he? He says, he must become greater. I must become less. That's what John wants you to take away from the picture. He says, he must become greater. He's the great bridegroom. I must become less. There is that moment in the Christian life where you realize Kids and teenagers, just give me your full focus for a second. There's a moment in your life where you might realize that Jesus is the Son of God, right? Um, And then uh, you realize that God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and Jesus is the Son, right? Uh, And then there might be a moment where you realize that Jesus died on the cross. That really happened. Uh, But more than that, you might realize that he died for you. Maybe that's you. Just track with me in your head. You don't have to answer me out loud. But where are you there? Have you realized those things? And then maybe after that, you realize that Jesus rose again and that he was and he is alive. That's all part of the, isn't it? Part of the process. Maybe as adults, maybe you're there already or maybe you're somewhere along that, that process. But there's a moment in the Christian life where on top of all of that, he died for me. He's the son of God. He rose again. There's a moment in the Christian life when you realize that it is all about him. Nods of heads, yeah, yeah. It's a game changer. It's a life changer when you just simply realize that it is all about him. The, the whole of history is about him. 
The whole of the Bible from start to finish is all about him. The whole of world history is all about him. The whole of life itself is all about him. The whole of your life is not your life because it's all about him. One uh, author was talking about this, this moment here with John. He says, the Christian life is not about getting God into your story, but about getting your life into God's story. That's a game changer, isn't it? The, the Christian life it is not uh, about getting God into your story, like your story's marching on and we'll slot God in where we can. No, it's about getting your life into God's story because that's what the whole thing is about. It's all about him. And so John says in verse 30, he must become greater, I must become less. John is defined by Jesus. Just think through the imagery. He's the friend of the bridegroom. His whole role and purpose and everything about his life is actually always in relation to Jesus. He's the bridegroom, so I'm the friend of the bridegroom. I'm the, I'm the best man. That's even in our language that we use today. That you say the best man. Well, the, the best man of who? That's the whole point of the name, isn't it? You're the best man, right? So who are you the best man of? Because your whole role on that day is, the whole thing is in relation to him, the bridegroom. Your life is defined by him. You will be eclipsed by him. Because it's all about him. You know you can't overdo it with Jesus. Do you ever sometimes think that? Maybe you could get a bit like, a bit OTT about Jesus, a bit too much about Jesus. No, you can never overdo it when it comes to Jesus. You can never make too much of him. You can never make too much of uh, Jesus. Again, J.C. Ryle, vicar of uh, Helmingham, he's put it like this. We can never make too much of Christ. We can never have too high thoughts about Christ, can never love him too much, trust him too implicitly, lay too much weight upon him and speak too highly in his praise. He is worthy of all the honor that we can give him. And then he says, he will be all in heaven. Let us see to it that he is all in our hearts on earth. It's all about him. You cannot make too much of Jesus. And John says, big up the bridegroom. Make much of Jesus in your hearts and your lives. He must become greater. I must become less. It's in that image and picture as well, isn't it? It's their big day, the bridegroom, the bride. It's their big day. Well, every day is Jesus' big day because <laughs> he made days <laughs> and he's the Lord of history and he's the maker of all things and he's the eternal son. So every day is his big day. Every day is a day to make much of Jesus in your hearts and your minds and your lives. Where do I fit here? You might be sat there, you think, where do I fit in this, this image, this wedding, this, this whole picture, this, th this thing? We, we, we've seen this, you know, kind of, we're like the best man a bit. We're, we're like the friend of, uh, who attends the bridegroom, for sure. Yeah. But that's not all, is it? Nathan uh, set us up here, didn't he? Because actually, where do I fit here? If you're a Christian here today, then you're the beloved. You're part of the bride of Christ. You're the loved one here in this picture. John the Baptist simply goes back to the Old Testament, pillages the Old Testament, particularly Hosea, and, and this idea that the bride of God is the people of God. God's people are his bride. It's an Old Testament picture, an image. He, he picks that up. Uh, Paul does it as well in Ephesians 5. We've seen that before. Uh, and John applies it here. God's people are his bride. And so here, where do I fit? Where am I? If you're a Christian here today, then yeah, you're the, the sort of best man, the sort of friend who attends a bridegroom, make much of Jesus, but you are also the beloved. You are loved by God. It's both. 
It's both. And actually, how do I make much of Jesus in my life? How do I actually do that? It's when you realize how much he loves you, isn't it? The more you realize how loved you are by Jesus, unimaginably loved, the more you're able to make much of him in your heart, your life, in your words, in your workplace, with your family. So John says, big up the bridegroom. That's the big thing, really, this morning. Big up the bridegroom. Make much of Jesus. But there is something before that. There's something um, prior to that, if we could have <coughs> the next slide. Uh, and that is to believe in the bridegroom. Uh, it makes sense, doesn't it? it you, you can't big him up if you don't actually believe in him. And that's where the, the passage goes. And simply following the logic of the passage here, uh, believe in the bridegroom. That's, that's where we're taken next. Believe in the bridegroom. Believe in Jesus. Jesus has a remarkable vantage point, doesn't he? This is what he says in verse 31. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. Again, we're taken to this picture. We keep seeing it. You get bored of it but each week. But Jesus is the one from above. He's come from above, down to earth, to save us, ultimately. He's the one from above. Uh, and here in verse 31, he says, look, he's, he's the one from above. Uh, the one who comes from heaven is above all, end of verse 31. But there are others as well, he says, and they're from the earth. John the Baptist, as good as he was, he's from the earth. So he speaks as one from the earth. Can't do any other, can he? He's not from above, he's from the earth. Muhammad is from the earth. He says some insightful things, some interesting things, maybe even some helpful things, but he's from the earth. He's not from above. Buddha is from the earth. He speaks as one from the earth. Liz Truss is from the earth. She speaks as one from the earth. Any other politician? or any other figure throughout, they're all from the earth. They speak as one from the earth. They might say some wise, helpful, or useful things, but they're from the earth. Our late queen, as good as she was, <laughs> was from the earth. But he's from above. He has a unique vantage point. He can reveal God uh, to us, and that's where he goes next, doesn't he? Verse 32, he testifies to what he has seen and heard. So he's from above, and he's seen and heard. No one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it is certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. He's the one from above, and he speaks the words of God from above. Now, just for one moment, some of you um, might be coming along and you're listening to all of this and you go, hang on a minute, Rich, got an objection at this point. This is all very circular, isn't it? So the Bible says that Jesus is the one from above and that he therefore speaks from God and as Jesus speaks, he's speaking from God because he is the one from... Do, do you see what I mean? It's a little bit circular. Uh, it is circular. That's the answer, actually. It is circular. Because all claims to absolute authority are circular. They, they, they have to be. Otherwise, they're not a claim to absolute authority. You'll come across people, maybe yourself, you say, oh, I, I believe in science. Why? Well, because cause it's science. You know, it's sciencey, isn't it? It's scientific. You know, the scientific method, and you follow them, and, you da, 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 and if that happens multiple times, then you've got theory. And, you know, it, it's scientific. It's remarkably circular, that, isn't it? Remarkably circular. I believe in science because, well, it's scientific. <laughs> That's quite circular. Or, or you might say, or maybe your friend says or something, you know, see, look, well, look, look, I'm not into all this religious mumbo-jumbo stuff. No, you know, I've got reason. I've got, I've got reason and logic, and I reason and, you know, follow the logic and reason things out, and that's how I find truth. That's how I get to answers. Why? Well, because it's reasonable. Well, it's rational, you know, it's sensible, isn't it? Right, so you believe that reason is the way to truth because of reason, because it's reasonable. That's remarkably circular, isn't it? <laughs> you see, all claims to absolute authority are circular. What you have to do <laughs> is examine the circle, examine the evidence. 
And when it comes to Jesus, don't just, you can do, examine the historical evidence around Jesus. Examine the eyewitness accounts around Jesus. Yeah, for sure do that, but examine him. (laughs) Get through all of that and examine him, himself. It's a little bit crass, but you know what I mean. All claims to absolute authority are circular, and this is circular, of course. What you've got to do is examine the circle for yourself. And how you respond to Jesus is how you respond to God, isn't it? Verse 35, the Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. You see, the Father and the Son are in this unique relationship of love. And so, however you treat Jesus is how you treat God, the God who made you. What do you make of him? There's an ominous note in the final verse, isn't there? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. We saw this last week, didn't we? God's wrath is on us because we have committed crimes against the God who made us. Remember we said we've been godless. No real time for God. We, we, we've rejected God. We, we've been selfish. Uh, we've, in all sorts of ways, committed crimes against God and people that he's made. And the punishment fits the crime. The Bible says that this is a serious crime. To offend the God who made you is serious. And so the punishment, the penalty for that crime is the death penalty. That's what we're owed. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And we all face this, and that's why it says, look, if you reject the Son, then God's wrath remains on you. It was already on you. But how you respond to Jesus determines whether it remains on you or not. It remains on you unless you take the way out. And it's there in the verse, isn't it? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects The Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. The wonderful news of Christianity is that Jesus, as it were, has climbed into the dock in your place, let you go, and taken the wrath that should be yours on himself. So it all hinges on how you respond to Jesus. Are you going to accept him or reject him? Accept him and you have eternal life. Reject him and you, God's wrath remains on you. Being on the computer, uh, huh, uh, yeah, I've had a few things going on with my computer this week, but about a week ago I was on the computer and their box popped up, accept or reject cookies. Now I accept cookies, all right? I'll take cookies from anyone, right? Rick left a packet of cookies in my office the other week. Yeah, fine, do that as much as you want. I accept cookies, but uh, that's not the kind of cookies it's talking about. It's something to do with data, isn't it? I don't really know what these cookies are. I don't know much. Kev probably knows what these cookies are. But anyway, it says accept or reject uh, cookies. And that's a trivial use of the language of accept or reject, isn't it? It doesn't really matter in the grand scheme. Kev always said, well, it probably does, but yeah, in the grand scheme of your life, it doesn't really matter whether you accept or reject cookies. <laughs> but it does matter whether you accept or reject Jesus. When God the Father says this to you, it does matter what you do with Jesus. Will you accept or reject my son? That's what he's saying. You see what's at stake there? The God who made everything says, will you accept or reject my son? This is life and death. This determines your eternal destination. It all hangs on how you respond to Jesus. So do you accept or do you reject Jesus? That's the question this morning. You've met him. What do you make of him? What do you make of him? And many of you will say this morning, well, I believe in him, Rich. Great. Good. You have eternal life. Uh, and more than that, you're the beloved. <laughs> you're the bride of Christ. Don't worry, it's not individually. You don't have to put the dress on. 
you're the bride of Christ. Christ, you're the beloved of Christ. You are more loved than you could ever imagine, and you belong to him. That's what it says, isn't it? Verse 29, uh, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. You belong to Jesus. So big up the bridegroom. Be content to be a lesser lamp and a lesser light, an eclipsed star. And as Ryle put it, he will be all in heaven. Let us see to it that he is all in our hearts on earth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that it was love that brought him to our earth. Your love that sent your one and only son so that we could have life so that we could know you, so that we could be in a relationship with you, our Heavenly Father, and be called your children. Father, we thank you for Jesus. And Father, we pray that you would help us to make much of him. Father, I pray you'd help us to believe in him, to trust in him, to know him even today, and to make much of him in our hearts, in our words, and in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.